uh wow okay um if you haven't seen the community post i put out yet and you haven't seen the number on the channel wherever it is we've done 10,000 subscribers we've blown past 10,000 subscribers i what can i say at this point beyond a continuous thank you to everyone who has constantly supported this channel when I rebooted the channel four months ago at this point, we were on 741 subs, which is where it had been in stasis, essentially, for the last, felt like four years, I think. And then it seems once we hit 1,000 in the first week of June, it's just been a complete non-stop roller coaster ride. And the fact that we're here now at 10,500, I think, is completely mind-blowing. And I just, I can't thank you guys enough. If anything... It's a surefire sign that people still love this franchise and that people are ready and willing for it to return to prominence, as I think it will when the anime finally comes back. Um, I definitely think the excitement is really here with the fan base, and I am honoured that you guys have enjoyed the content I've been putting out so far. Believe me, it's just going to continue. Um, but yeah, I, I, there's not really much else to say other than thank you so much for pushing this channel forwards, carrying it on, on your backs and just pioneering us as a go-to place for Bleach fans. And I super appreciate that. That's what I always wanted from this channel. You know, I started YouTube to review Bleach on a weekly basis because I believed, well, for two reasons. I believed I had something to offer the community in regards to my sort of insight and analysis into the chapters and the characters and whatnot, and also because I wanted to talk about Bleach with someone. Like, that's the major reason I started this channel back in 2012. And now we're closing in on a million views altogether, a million channel views, video views, and, uh, you know, over 10,000 subs, and I just, I kind of can't believe this is actually happening. So, thank you. And I wanted to do a video, I wanted to do a top 10 for, you know, 10,000 subs, and I, I felt a more personal one um, was pretty apt here. So this video really is as subjective as they get. This is my top 10 favourite characters in Bleach as a whole. And obviously I don't expect you guys to agree because it's m literally my list. Um, I always try to be as objective as possible when it comes to the other top 10s. This one, though, very much my 10 favourite characters. So that does mean, however, that I'd love to see your lists in the comments below as well. I'd love to see which characters in this series have stood out to you, have made an impact on you um, and stayed with you throughout, you know, the last few years. Before we get started, however, though, if you are new to this channel and you love Bleach, then just hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, give the video a like, keep the exposure growing. If you want to be a part of this community, everyone here basically just loves the franchise, can't wait for it to return. Follow me on Twitter, join the Discord, it's a great group of people. Um, if, you, if you play Brave Souls, you know, we've got some guilds going on. Uh, we'd love to have you, so just make sure to hit those buttons now, and let's keep the channel growing. So before the top 10, I've got three honourable mentions that I'd like to include because I really did want to have them on the top 10 list, but they just didn't quite make it for one reason or another. So let's just get through these guides pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, let's begin. Honourable mention number one is the former captain of the third division, the traitorous Gein Ichimaru. We've done a whole video analysing this guy, 40 minutes worth of Gein content for you guys. But as I say in that video, he was pretty much my favourite character um, when I first started reading and watching Bleach. He was basically the absolute standout to me from a design perspective, personality perspective. I love the role he played. But he hasn't... He never... Because of the way Kubo treated Gein, the way he pushed him almost into irrelevancy for the longest part of the Arankar arc, he fell out of the top 10 for me. He just didn't do enough, you know, being relegated so hard into the background um, kind of brought him down a few notches for me on my personal scale. I love the, the, the end of his story, the stuff with Rangiku, the stuff with Aizen, the betrayal, everything like that, but it doesn't make up for essentially shoving Gein to the wayside to make room for the Espada, because that's literally what Kubo did. So that was a big shame, but Gein will always remain one of my favourite characters. The next honourable mention on my list is an interesting one, and it's actually the king of the Quincy's Yuhabak. And I've decided that's the pronunciation I think I'm going to go for. It just seems to make sense. It's a fusion of 
Yuha Bach and a few like a Yuha Ba thing. So Yuha Bach sounds kind of right to me. It sounds similar-ish to the Japanese Yuha Ba Ha. I don't know. Either way, this guy kind of blew me away when when the Thousand Year Blood War started. I was like. This is the villain Bleach has needed for a long time. And I actually really want to do a video on this particular topic, on the kind of villain that Bleach needed. Um, but Yuha Bark was so ruthless. He was a warlord. He didn't wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. In many ways, he was the complete inverse of Aizen. I love that he was on the front lines in the first invasion. I love that he was, you know, involved in the fights, beating up Kenpachi. I was like, this is so cool. And then Kubo kind of ruined his character for me. Everything after the Almighty just... Oh, man, I just didn't like it at all. It felt like two completely different characters in many ways. Yuha Bark always had the element of the sort of all-father about him. I loved the way he called the Quincy's his children, like this twisted version of parenthood. But Kubo sort of took it to the extreme when he absorbed the Soul King and... All Yuha Bark said after that was like just cryptic nonsense about bloodlines and his eyes and my eyes can see everything. And it's really, really telling. If you kind of go back and say around 626, which is when the Soul King is absorbed and stuff like that, Yuha Bark stops making any sense. <laughs> he stops making any sense. He becomes considerably more cliche. Um, he stops using Quincy techniques and he just basically starts spewing Black Rayatsu and it was a big, I, I was really disappointed by all of that and I thought Kubo drove what was originally a cold-blooded pragmatic warlord completely off the rails into a guy who barely gets out of his seat for the final battle which was really disappointing um, and you know eventually he kind of for the shortest amount of time he does start roughing people up again in the final fight with Aizen and Ichigo, but it's not enough, you know, it's a fragment of the character who we were introduced to, so that's why Yuha Bark doesn't quite make the top 10. And the final honourable mention that I want to bring up is an incredibly underrated character in my eyes, and that is the captain, or the former captain I should say, of the 7th Division, Seijin Komamura, who I have always had a soft spot for. Uh, I love his design. I love the fact that he heralds from the Beast Realm. I mean, that is just so cool immediately. It's this whole untapped region of Soul Society that, you know, in the manga at least, we just found out barely anything about, but it was enough to be tantalising. But I love Komamura's stoicism. I love his sort of good-natured heart. But I also love how his storyline is like the inverse of the regular hero's journey. Komamura goes through so much with Tozen and stuff like that. At the start, he's very focused on wanting to bring Tozen back to the light. Um, but eventually, when the Quincy's come and kill Yamamoto, Komamura succumbs to that revenge, that animalistic drive that he has always tried to fend off. And you get this idea that he's he's been like one bad day away from going down this path at any point and I think him turning into a human to showcase that revenge was artful I think Kuo did such a good job with Komamura in the final arc it's just such a shame that he got written out of the entire second half because of it Komamura has always been a bit of a joke character to a lot of people and I kind of get it he loses a lot of fights um the only character he defeats pretty much outright at least to begin with is Poe, who's a fraction, and it, he, Komora has to basically kill himself to be able to defeat Bambietta. So it's not hard to see why c people have underrated Komora in the past, but I've always really liked him. And I, I personally got the impression that Kubo liked him as well. I got the impression that Kubo was always at odds with Komora's relative lack of popularity in the fan base because he isn't that popular. Um, but I always think that Kubo kind of liked him. You know, he gives him these incredible entrances almost every time he shows up. Kokujo Tengen Mio is one of the most visually amazing Bankai in the series. Um, yeah, and, and out of all the captains who had their Bankai stolen, I think Komamura has easily the most interesting storyline out of all of them. It just happens to result in him getting written out. <laughs> With Komamura, it's never easy. Everything is always a Pyrrhic victory. And... Yeah, I, I, I always be in this guy's corner. Anyway, moving on to the top 10 characters. My top 10 favourite characters in Bleach as a whole. So, number 10. 
Number 10 is actually the main man himself, Ichigo. As far as protagonists go in shonen manga, but also in fiction in general, I actually really like Ichigo. He's not a typical main character at all in many ways. I always found him to be quite real. You know, he's not very happy a lot of the time. He goes through periods of depression and happiness, and he fights with all of that. Um, unlike a lot of other shonen characters, uh, main characters, who are almost perpetually incredibly happy. And Ichigo is one of these characters who doesn't spew things like, oh, my friends are what gives me strength, or all this sort of thing, which is fine. It's a shonen cliche. It's a trope. But I found it really refreshing that Ichigo doesn't really have too much of that. There are some instances of it, of it in Bleach, but for the most part, Ichigo kind of relies on his own strength, which I always really liked. There's also, you know, the fact that Kubo just absolutely excels in almost every area of Ichigo's design, from his Bankai's to his Fantastic and Shikai to his hollow form, which is incredible. Everything around Ichigo from a design standpoint is nearly flawless as well. So I really enjoy the fact that Ichigo has a non-traditional goal in mind in that he doesn't really have a goal other than to protect everyone around him using the power he has which I think is uh, best exemplified during his battle with Ginjo. That's when you really find out Ichigo's goal in the way their paths diverged and Ichigo chose to protect, whereas Ginjo didn't. I, I always thought that was really interesting. And Ichigo obviously has some of the best fights in the series as well. There's no getting around that. So Ichigo, for me, great protagonist, and I've always really enjoyed him as a main character. Number nine on my list goes to the captain of the sixth division, Byakuya Kuchki. And of all the su sort of super popular, super exposed captains, Byakuya is the one who I definitely like the most, no questions asked. I think by far he is probably one of the best developed characters in the series, one of the best written characters in the series. I love the way he goes from completely law abiding to a fault, you know, to going so far as to push forth the execution of his own sister. Then you find out that he was kind of pained by that and you learn the truth about that and he slowly sort of comes out of his shell to respecting Ichigo, to helping them from the sidelines, to helping them directly when he kills Tsukishima just because he's an enemy of Ichigo no matter their past. And it culminates really nicely in, in Byakuya who is the sort of steadfast protector of soul society, you know, as one of its most prominent members and one of its most prominent nobles, I feel Byakuya has always felt that he bears the responsibility and the burden of Soul Society on his shoulders. When he fails in that duty and is nearly killed by Asnot in the Quincy invasion, it was the perfect, perfect cyclical character development for this character. He suddenly comes to rely on the boy who was once a Ryoka, who was once this foreign invader who stepped onto the, in Byakuya's eyes, the Soul Society's holy ground and besmirched all of their ancient uh, traditions like Bankai and stuff like that. And now, inches from death, Byakuya asks him to save Soul Society. And for me, not only is that one of the best moments in the entire series, it's the perfect way to end Byakuya's character. Of course, he didn't actually die. Kubo brings him back to life and he sort of just hangs around, doesn't really do a lot, but I don't think it hurts his character necessarily. And he looks pretty badass with his like royal guard outfit on. Uh, I like that he is there for Rukia to push her to use her Bankai and defeat Az. I thought that was really cool. Um, and yeah, Byakuya being saved from death doesn't really hurt his character in the long run, I don't think. And he's definitely one of my favourites. I think Senbon Zakura is one of the most creative Zanpak Toes in the series and is very powerful as well. Um, and maybe it's just because we are so overexposed to it, but I think, yeah, I think Byakuya is just a really awesome character and one of Bleach's best written. Number eight on this list is the first villain in this list, and you'll find out that there are actually quite a lot of bad guys on this list. I tend to always prefer villains in fiction, I don't really know why, I just think they're more interesting, but this guy is not really a traditional bad guy, and that's actually the first Espada, Coyote Stark. And again, I've done a whole video on this character, um, whether or not he was worthy of his role as the Primera Espada, I steadfastly believe that he was. Um, I think that he's clearly incredibly powerful, but I also like that he doesn't want to fight. You know, he's the antithesis of a shonen bad guy. He's not cocky. He's not brash. He's not in your face. He doesn't want to fight. There's no bloodlust in Stark whatsoever. And I thought that was really refreshing, not only 
that again like i say he is not a traditional bad guy but also that kubo put him in such a position of power like this is the number one espada obviously yami is zero and he is literally a traditional shonen bad guy but that's a video in and of itself but stark is so interesting uh from a personality standpoint but also has one of the slickest and coolest designs in the series um with his resurrection just looking so badass um and i always thought that stark was just a really interesting case of Wasted potential is a little bit harsh, but it would have been really cool to see him in a post Eisen world to see how he would have fit in with the Arankar and the Espada when they were helping out against the Quincy and stuff like that. I would have loved to have seen it. I also think the debate around whether or not Stark was actually evil is really interesting as well, because evil is a very strong word and it comes with a lot of connotations, but you also can't ignore the fact that Stark was well aware of Aizen's intentions to annihilate Karakura, and he was obviously fine with that. Um, so I think, I don't know, I, I think uh, it's it's hard to say whether Stark was evil or not. I don't think he was, I don't think he was, but this is the sort of debate I love, and it's probably a video in and of itself, but I love Stark, I think he's a really cool character. Um, and it was a shame to see him kind of go as early as he did. I think of all the Espada, he was probably the one that was underutilized the most, considering his potential. Now, the seventh character on this list is another character that I have already done an entire video on. Um, pretty much, I feel like eventually we're going to get to the stage where everyone I introduce is going to be like that. Um, but this character is the humble and mysterious shopkeeper, Kisuke Urahara. Now, Urahara has so many layers to this character, it's crazy. From his earliest days um, in the stealth division as like a jailer, you know, that's where he kind of gained his uh, hard worldview. Um, you know, Urahara is a very uh, unflinchingly unapologetic character. He does things for the greater good of soul society, no matter the human cost. And that question of morality has always made him utterly fascinating to me. Not to mention his design, which is completely iconic and synonymous with Bleach as a franchise, both in and out of the industry. People who don't even really know manga know Kisuke because, well, they know he's Bleach, that striped hat and everything like that. It's totally synonymous with the franchise. Um, but yeah, Urahara I've always found to be fascinating. I think he is the archetypal version of that dichotomy of personalities, the super kind of super happy fun guy who's like really kind of carefree on the outside but you know he's harboring darkness you know he's harboring in many ways like guilt um but also just a sinister nature to him which we will see that reflected in the top half of this list as well um but yeah kisuke great character i love benahime as well it's one of my favorite zanpak toe uh, in the series i think his bankai kubo pulled it off i think it was completely um fitting for the character really really cool and i love its simplicity as well that's one of my favorite things but Kisuke, great character, easily one of my favourites. And rounding out the bottom half of this list with the sixth character is actually the full bringer, Tsukishima Shukuro. I feel like this one might be quite divisive. I think Tsukishima kind of rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. I mean, the full bring arc in general is pretty divisive. It's widely hated across the Bleach community by a lot of people. And that is a video I'm actively planning. Um, I'm, I'm working on a pretty lengthy documentary style video on the Lost Agent arc, which I, I, I hope you guys will enjoy. I know I'm going to love talking about it because the arc fascinates me. And Tsukishima is probably the most memorable thing about the arc. His ability, Book of the End, completely messes with Ichigo in a way we've never seen before. Tsukishima obviously can't compete with Ichigo on a physical um, sort of level, so he resorts to just completely screwing with his mind in the worst possible way. And I always found that to be absolutely fascinating. I think what lets Tsukushima down is his relative lack of motivation. Essentially everything he does, he does for Ginjo, but it was a little disappointing to find out that he was essentially Ginjo's lapdog. I was a little disappointed with the way his character just kind of completely fell apart the moment Ginjo was dead. Um, and also the fact that we didn't get any kind of backstory on Tsukishima, at least in the manga, was a huge disappointment. And it really meant that we were lacking any kind of necessary context as to why he was the way he was. And Tsukishima is one of the most evil and, you know, just... Sociopathic characters in the entire series. I feel like it would have been incredibly useful to have had that context during the Lost Agent arc, as he is essentially one of the major driving forces of that story. But despite that, 
I think the guy has a really, really cool design. I love the way he looks. Um, of all the human fighters, he's definitely one of the devi most devious and one of the smartest. The fight with Biakia is actually one of my favourites in the series. I know that's kind of weird because the Fallbring arc is not exactly known for its battles, but I really enjoy that one. And I think the way Kubo drew Tsukishima as well is just something to really enjoy. Kubo did this thing with Tsukishima that he didn't really do with any other characters and that he kind of added like a tone to the guy's face and then made his pupils really white because Tsukishima is one of the rare characters in Bleach who doesn't have a like a light source in his eyes. You know, clearly supposed to showcase that he's actually, you know, really quite a dark individual. Um, but he would do this thing where he would invert the colours of his eyes and just make him look really, really creepy. And I just loved the trolly nature of Tsukushima as well. I thought he worked really, really well as the major villainous driving force of that particular story arc. Um, it was a little bit of a shame to see him take a back seat. In many ways, the Lost Agent arc is very similar to the Soul Society arc. Tsukushima is essentially the gene of that arc. Um, and I wonder, in fact, if Kubo was doing those parallels on purpose. When Ginjo is revealed to be the true villain much in the same way as Aizen, Tsukushima ends up being take, forced to take a back seat. Um, but I don't, I just, I don't, it doesn't hurt him too much in my eyes. I still love the character. I think he's incredibly cool. Um, but there's not a huge amount of depth to Tsukushima. He just is one of my favourite characters because I love the way he messes with the cast. I love his fight. Um, I think his abilities are really, really cool. And I absolutely would have loved to have seen him turn up in the Thousand Year Blood War a little bit sooner than he finally eventually does and actually do something of more merit but at least he helps out in the final battle so that was pretty cool but yeah Tsukushima one of my favorite characters in the series right entering the top five now these are my five favorite characters in all of Bleach and they are nearly all bad guys I think there is one good guy in uh, in the top five so that's kind of interesting but character number five then Character number five, then, is the fourth Espada, Ulkiora Cypher, or I, I remember it being spelt like Schiffer a long time ago. I don't know. I genuinely don't really know how to pronounce it, to be honest, at this point. But he is definitely one of my favourite characters, as essentially the lead villain for the vast majority of the Arankar arc. I know Aizen is technically the main bad guy, but Ulkiora is the face of evil in that arc. He is the statuesque, stoic, emotionless wall that Ichigo is like constantly having to come up against and he's so extremely powerful that Ichigo is in fact killed against him. You know, almost killed the first time and then he is actually finished off in their second battle and I think Ulkyo represents such an in is such an interesting character because he is so infallible in the way he approaches situations like that and that is all down to his personality. He's very um, nihilistic, you know, that's his aspect of death after all, is that he, everything is meaningless before him. If he doesn't see something with his own eyes, it doesn't exist. And I really, really think that he's a very unique character. I think he's definitely one of the most interesting villains in the series, for sure, with, again, a fantastic design, of course. Um, but his whole arc throughout the Arankar arc is quite interesting to see. He gets some interesting moments with Orihime and then his whole story arc is kind of about him understanding the human heart and understanding humans and what humans fight for and what they believe in and how it differs to hollows and how he sees it, you know, he sees existence to be kind of like this meaningless thing, but as he dies, he kind of understands meaning and, and, and he understands the heart. And I always thought that was really interesting. I thought it was really well done. Um, obviously, Ichigo versus Ulkiora round two is basically one of the best fights in the entire series, if not the best in many people's opinion. Um, that's a video I'll obviously do at some point, uh, but Ulkiora in that fight is incredible. His second release looks amazing. Um, it's kind of funny because I remember when it, we saw his first release for the first ever time, and I was like, yeah, okay, it looks kind of cool. Um, and I, I was just like, I don't know about the I don't know about the dress. <laughs> I, I like the wings. The wings look really cool, and the double horn helmet looks cool. But other than that, it's not really blowing me away. Then, as if Kubo heard my thoughts, he brought out the Segunda Etapa, and I was like, "This is exactly what I imagine Ulkiora's release form to look like all the time." <laughs> um, but yeah, I Ulkiora is just like one of these characters that I have a lot of nostalgia for. I think um, reading not only the fake Karakura Town arc but the Ulkiora fight weekly. Um, and just seeing the effect he had both on Ichigo, Orihime, and like the fan base in general really brings back a lot of memories. Um, and Ukiura to this day is definitely one of Ichigo's most formidable opponents he's ever defeated. Ichigo never really defeated Ukiura, you know, at the end of the day. It was it was Zangetsu 
you know, the very base form of Ichigo's instincts coming out and just tearing him a new one. Um, and all Cura's death was, you know, fantastically well done. I, if you haven't seen it already, it's in my top five best uh, death scenes video. Um, and I just think that all Cura was treated incredibly well by Kubo for pretty much his entire time on the series. Uh, and I know a lot of people would have liked to have seen all Cura come back in some capacity, even though it was essentially impossible. But I think that he served his purpose really well, and I don't... I, I think there's... I honestly wouldn't want much more out of that character. I think he, he was pretty much a, a, a fantastic obstacle um, for Ichigo. My fourth favourite character in Bleach is actually the main villain... Not of the series, eh? I thought I was going to say Aizen, but no, the main villain of the Fullbring arc, Ginjo Kugo. Now, I know Ginjo is not the most popular character, but... Allow me to present the reasons why I really, really enjoy this guy's character and would have loved to have seen considerably more of him than we actually got. Now, obviously, again, we're going back to the Fullbring arc. As I mentioned earlier, with Tsukushima, not the most popular arc in the series, kind of divisive among fans. And again, that is a topic I really want to get into in the future. And a lot of people don't really like Ginjo because he is obviously so heavily associated with that arc. Um, he appears in like, I would say 75% of those chapters at least, if not more, and he is the major force behind the whole arc. What I really love about Ginjo, though, because his design doesn't particularly blow me away, especially his, like, regular base self, it's not Kubo's best design. I do like how he looks once he has the full bring that he's stolen from Ichigo. That looks really cool, and his Bankai looks cool as well. Um, and obviously Cross of Scaffold is one of the coolest looking weapons in the series, in my opinion. But what really, what I love about Ginjo is his personality, and he is by far and away one of the most three-dimensional villains in Bleach, in my opinion. And a lot of this has to do with the way Kubo plays with the character's allegiances and his own mind, thanks to Book of the End, but I think it does Ginjo wonders as a character. Ichigo, in his family, has always played the role, obviously, of the big brother. He has two little sisters and a, and a dad and obviously no mum. But as Ishin doesn't show up an awful lot throughout the series, you know, you kind of do come to see Ichigo as this guy who looks after himself most of the time. And I thought it was really interesting, the dynamic between Ichigo and Ginjo. Ginjo very much appearing like this older brother figure to Ichigo, who, you know, we had never experienced that before in the series. And yeah, Ginjo, you're supposed to, you're never supposed to trust Ginjo. And that was what I always found was so interesting about him. He could swap between a regular sort of Shinji-esque ally to being this almost stereotypical shadows going across the face villain. Um, and I loved that Kubo very much played up both sides of that with this guy. Um, Ginjo, I love his pragmatism. I love how he's so different from so many other characters in Bleach. You know, there are a couple of moments that stand out to me are when Ichigo starts getting concerned that Tsukishima might have taken an interest in his friends. And he starts freaking out, and Ichigo's freaking out a lot in this arc, um, and Ginjo's response is just like, I know, stay calm, and, it, and, it, and it, I really liked that, I really thought, I love Ginjo's to the pointness, obviously at the start of the arc he's a bit shady, and Kubo indulges himself quite a lot in how kind of um, vague he makes Ginjo, but as, as time goes on their relationship develops and deepens, and it becomes really interesting to see them working together, especially when things start spiralling out of control. When Ginjo is revealed to be a villain, I don't mind it. Yeah, he, he becomes more two-dimensional. There's no getting around that. But I still think he's one of the most interesting villains in the series. He very much wants Ichigo on side. Um, obviously, only after Ichigo has his powers back. Beforehand, he was perfectly happy to just leave him, to, not to die, but leave him be. When Ichigo appears to be a threat, all of a sudden, Ginjo wants him on side. But there is still this brotherly kind of bond between them. And Ginjo is so underrated, in my opinion, because there's no one else in Bleach like him. Because he is wholly unique in his relationship to Ichigo, in that they are both substitute Shinigami. Therefore, they both have a relationship with the Soul Society that is completely unique. Um, and never seen again in the series. And I think nowhere near enough was done with that substitute Shinigami stuff. Um... I absolutely despise the fact that we didn't get his backstory in the canon manga. That was hard. Kubo dedicated pages to Giriko's backstory, but nothing to Ginjo in, in the in the actual manga. Genuinely one of the most disappointing moments, and I remember this so vividly, was Kubo finishing 
what was it, chapter 478 or something like that, with the shot of Ginjo as a Shinigami. And then starting the next chapter in the present day with Tsukushima bawling his eyes out. And I was like, you, you, I could not believe that we were skipping over that. So I hated that. But I loved Ginjo's angle. I thought it was really cool how he felt he'd been betrayed by the Soul Society, how he was out for revenge. And his final moments with Ichigo are just so well done when he's like, you know, I, if we were swapped places, would you be here? Would I be there? I thought that you would stand by me shoulder to shoulder. And, you know, it's just... There's no other character like him, and I think he's incredibly well done. And yeah, it's a shame that he doesn't show up more in Thousand Year Blood War arc. He barely gets any lines, but you know, I, I appreciate Ginjo a lot for what he brings to the series, predominantly for what he brings to Ichigo. Um, and that to me makes him one of my favourite characters. I think he's fascinating. Right, top three, my top three favourite characters. And I think some of you, particularly those of you who have watched any of my recent Brave Souls videos, probably assumed this guy was going to be in here somewhere. Um, the only Stern Ritter to actually make this list. Uh, I'm kind of surprised at that myself, to be honest, but my third favourite character in the series has to be Stern Ritter D, Askin Naklavar. Now, as far as the characters on this list go, Askin is a real late bloomer. He only actually shows up in the series properly when there's about just over, just over 100 chapters to go, about 150 chapters left of the entire franchise, and he makes one hell of an impression, at least in my opinion. His design may not be all that to look at, he kind of does look like an eccentric, flamboyant version of Aizen, um, but that's kind of the whole point. You know, you're supposed to think that Askin is a mere underling in his own eyes, but it's his personality and his abilities where he truly shines. Um, Especially in a sea of characters who either take themselves too seriously, this is the Stern Ritters, by the way, either take themselves too seriously, are defined by their shrifts, are defined by nothing but their fanatical loyalty to you, Harbach. Askin completely stands alone amongst the Stern Ritters as being the truly interesting one with truly unique motivations. Um, and I loved him. I thought he was the perfect counterpart to Kisuke, obviously, the perfect person for him to fight. And yeah, I just, I've spoken, I feel like I've spoken a lot about Askin in the past, but he really is one of my absolute favourites. There's this theme that permeates Askin's whole character, and that is that he is very genre savvy. He's seemingly aware of the fact that he's in a shonen battle manga, whereas no other character obviously is. But he does things that you would never expect a character in Bleach to do. Things like where he challenges Mayuri to a fight, and then when he realises, oh, maybe I won't win this, he just actually walks away. He just bails on the whole fight. I remember expecting the fight to continue, and then you don't see him again until the Gremmy battle. And I was like, he actually just left. And I thought that was really, really cool. Um, I, I, I love that sort of thing. Um, and, and the fact that he was very downplayed, he very much underestimates himself. I like that a lot. Um, he's obviously incredibly humble. Kubo seemed oddly self-aware in the way he wrote Askin a lot of the time. One of the big criticisms people had of the Sternritter in general was the fact that so many of them were completely up themselves. They all thought they were amazing, they all thought they were quite literally God's gift. Um, and people didn't like that. You know, it was alright for a couple of Sternritters, but like almost all of them felt that way. And Askin was completely the opposite. And you know, he even says something along the lines of, I don't like to talk about myself in absolute terms because I think people who do that end up looking like idiots. And it just, it was weirdly self-aware because it was like Kubo saying, yeah, I've realised I've written everyone like this, but Askin's not like that. So, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that as well. And obviously the death dealing is by far one of the most creative and interesting of the shrifts. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely love Askin. One of my favourite characters in the series. And it was a real shame when he died, but I loved his death as well. I thought it was absolutely fitting for, you know, the character who always saw himself further and further from death's door to literally stare at his own heart as it was held in front of him. I thought that was fantastic. As we enter the top two on this list, I did promise you that there was a good guy in this top five somewhere, but he does kind of tread the line between uh, hero and villainy sometimes. I think that's why I like him so much. So the number two character, my second favourite character in all of Bleach, is the current Captain Commander, Shunsui Kyoraku. Uh, in my opinion, Kyoraku is a nearly perfect Bleach character in almost every way. He has 
without a doubt one of the best designs in the series easily one of my favorite captain designs no questions asked it's instantly memorable um, and it has just so many layers to it as well he has so much going on compared to the majority of captains but it just works in every way whether that's from his straw hat to his pink flowery uh Hayori, to his frankly incredible looking zanpak toe cat in kyokotsu kyoroku has it De like completely nailed in terms of the aesthetics department and it just works so well everything about Kyoroku works so well you know he he's one of these characters who has this dual personality of being completely jovial and drunk and goofy and just completely laid back on the outside but the reality is he is one of the most perceptive characters in the entire series truly able to see through almost any situation and any person um, and that gives him a powerful amount of insight, and he's obviously also very sinister as well, and I love that. And I just love the way that that duality also plays out in his design. Like, you have the straw hat, which makes him, you know, gives off this almost, like, laid-back, restful vibe, especially when he, like, wears it over his eyes and he's, like, asleep, but the straw hat also creates the shadow over his eyes, and it helps him look really sinister when the time calls for it. The same, again, goes for everything else about him. He has this pink flowery kimono, um, but he has a pair of, like, really lethal-looking scimitars for weapons, and it's, like, everything about him is so well, well so well realized and that even extends to like when he gets the eye patch as well I, I want to do a whole video on kyoraku and the eye patch and the character development that it represents but just for now the cliff notes version i love the way his character transforms in the thousand year blood war i love kyoraku anyway but it really is the final arc where he just completely comes into his own and that burden of newfound responsibility absolutely transforms this guy um, we've already seen that he's willing to do whatever it takes in battle to win, but now that moves to politics as well. That moves to saving the world, and his whole his whole moment where he frees Eisen and everyone hates him for it, and he's just like, are you, oh, are you talking about pride? Well, why don't we talk about saving the Gote? You know, I don't believe that using evil to defeat evil is in itself an evil act. Uh, and that is just one of the best character moments in Bleach, as a whole, it totally, Kyoraku just completely comes into his own, and I don't think I'm the only one that feels this way, I think Kyoraku was already fairly popular, but I really believe that the Thousand Year Blood War elevated him to, you know, like, top tier popularity captain status, I really do. Um, he's not he's not shown quite as much as, like, the big dogs like Toshiro and Kenpachi, but he is shown quite a lot, and he gets good fights, uh, and Kubo puts his, frankly, incredibly creative Zanpakuto abilities to good use. So, yeah, Kyoraku, I, I can go on and on about this guy. I'm really looking forward to his character analysis video, if you couldn't tell. Um, but yeah, he's my second favourite character in the whole series. But there is only room for one favourite character in the entire series. I think I must have mentioned this on this channel before. Who this is, I think it's probably fairly obvious. I don't know. Maybe not. Um, but it, you know... Only one character can sit on the uh, the throne of heaven, the the vacant throne of heaven that is the uh, my favourite character in the series, um, and that is of course the former fifth division captain turned main villain of the entire series, Sosuke Aizen. Aizen is as perfect a character as you can nearly get in Bleach, in my opinion. Uh, in many ways, he completely carried the series for a good chunk of the fake Karakura Town arc. And bear in mind, I was reading the arc weekly, and Aizen was definitely the best thing about the series for, a, you know, that whole final battle, basically. Um, he is, in many ways, also a genre-savvy character, quite like, quite like Askin. Um... To the point where Aizen himself has become a meme. Like he is a he's a force of nature in so many ways. He's just so interesting. But I love I love that Kubo takes the time to show us his roots. You know, there's so much there is a lot of depth to this guy. I would say if anyone had a criticism they could level at Aizen, it would be that he doesn't have much depth, that he isn't there isn't much development that goes on there, but I just wouldn't agree with that at all. I think it's really interesting seeing his relationships with characters like Urahara and how he's very clearly got this inferiority complex going on with them, how he's determined to be better than Keisuke, um, even if that means, you know, taking on this godlike power. 
Um, I love that Aizen's transformations, as absurd as some of them may become, do unravel to reveal the monster within as he supposedly evolves. Um, and yeah, he gets stronger, but obviously he loses his humanity, which is quite an important thing to Aizen, I think. Um, but reality, the reason we love Aizen, we love the uh, the fact that he's planned everything out. One of my favourite Aizen moments is one of my favourite moments in the series where he gets Toshiro to stab Momo. And you get the immortal line, uh, when were you under the impression I wasn't using Kyokusu Getsu? That's genuinely probably the trolliest moment in the entire series, but it's just perfect and it sums up Aizen in every way. Kyokusui Getsu, it's a shame we never see its Bankai, but it, it, it is perfect for Aizen as a character. Uh, you it just It's iconic, you know, the deception that Aizen can produce with this illusion Zanpakuto is out of this world. Um, he's just a fantastic character in every way, and I don't know what there is to say that hasn't already been said about Aizen so many times across the internet by so many people more knowledgeable than I. Um, but yeah, he's fantastic. And Kubo nails again every aspect of his design it's um, it's inc it always still blows my mind um looking at the art and seeing how kubo was able to make him look so evil just by removing his glasses and pushing back his hair and it was like it's the same guy but he like looks different and it was like this is fantastically well done and i was i always found eisen to be completely just so interesting finding out his almost like his scientific roots and the experiments he was doing over a hundred years ago and just yeah, just everything about Aizen is bleach in a nutshell. I love that he came back in the final arc to help out, even if it was only very briefly, but it was really cool seeing him nonetheless. And you just you just can't help but love the arrogance that exudes from him because he knows he's like the best guy in the room. And it, yeah, I always found him completely fascinating. I think he is one of the most interesting characters in the series, just to get his worldview on things, to see where he stands in the universe and, and how he wants to bring about this change to the Bleach world. If I had any criticism to level at the way Kubo handled Eisen, it would be that he didn't let him go far enough. He didn't, especially when you compare him to Yuha Bark later on. Eisen, his threat level does seem paltry in comparison. That is the main issue. Uh, Eisen was very self-indulgent. Uh, he was not particularly pragmatic. Everything had to be very grandiose, very theatrical, and I think that da that leads to his eventual downfall, and that he barely accomplishes anything, really, when you think about it. You know, whereas Yuha Bark is very much this warlord who just trampled soul society. But, you know, it's the final arc, so things had to be a little bit different. But for me, Aizen is the best character in Bleach. He is my favourite character. Um, and yeah, I think I've exhausted basically everything I can say about this guy. Well, that's it for my top 10 favourite characters in Bleach. This was obviously a completely subjective list. It's just my favourite characters based on the reasons I have given. They are, like I said, they're pretty much all bad guys. There are some good guys sprinkled in there um, as well. But let me know, guys, in the comments below who your 10 favourite characters in Bleach are and why. If you'd like to add that as well, I'd be fascinated to read it. Like I said, if you haven't subscribed already... I'd, what's our next milestone? 20k? I don't know. That, that's kind of mad. I just, I can't even imagine the possibilities anymore. But if you haven't subscribed, make sure to hit that button now and let me know your 10 favourite characters as well. I'd love to see it. But again, before I sign off, just thank you so much for 10,000 subscribers. It's uh, just an absurd number that I never would have imagined uh, five years ago, let alone a month ago. Like, I, I, I think, yeah, I just, the channel has come a very long way and yeah, it's, it's really awesome. All right, guys, but until next time, I shall catch you later. See you then.